So the next speaker of this invited session, this invited speaker session, is Selim Esedoglu from the University of Michigan in the United States. He got his undergraduate from the Brown University and he holds a PhD and a master from the Kurand Institute of Mathematical Sciences. His research interests are image processing, computer vision, partial differential equations, calculus of variations, and conversions of numerical approximations. Among other prizes, he received the National Science Foundation Career Award. The title of his talk today is Algorithms for Motion of Networks by Weighted Mean Curvature. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, describe uh, a number of new developments in algorithms for simulating multi-phase motion by mean curvature, including in the anisotropic or weighted mean curvature case. This uh, line of work started uh, a few years ago uh, in collaboration with Felix Otto in, uh, around 2013, and in more recent years has been continuing with uh, a number of uh, students and former students at the University of Michigan, especially in the uh, anisotropy case, and uh, these are their uh, affiliations at the time of the, that the work was done. Okay, so uh, let me jump right in. Uh, many applications in science and engineering entail variational models with, uh, defined on partitions with some surface area penalty. Some uh, very well-known examples include uh, models for soap bubbles, foam. Uh, for us, most of the motivation is going to come from uh, material science, where such models arise in describing uh, grain boundary motion in poly polycrystalline materials. Uh, more recently, they have found use in computer vision in the context of image segmentation, and uh, also in, uh, uh, even more recently in machine learning applications, as was discussed by Andrea Bertozzi in her talk on Monday. Uh, so, uh, yeah, typically, we will be working in a domain D, which will be, let's say, a rectangle in, the, in R2 or a cube in R3 with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and our uh, cost function is going to be defined on partitions of such a domain. So by a partition, we mean a, a number of sets, sigma 1 through sigma n, that fill up the entire domain. So they, their union should be the entire domain D, and they should be essentially disjoint, meaning that uh, they are only allowed to ov uh, overlap along their boundaries. So there is no vacuum and no uh, overlap allowed. Uh, then the energy, the cost function uh, we'll be considering, is going to be defined in terms of the uh, size of the interfaces that form between these regions. So in the plane, for example, one might look at a cost function which just uh, measures the length of the curves that are formed at the boundaries of these regions and sums them up. Uh, in, th in three dimensions, uh, we would these curves would, of course, be replaced by surface patches, and then we will be looking at the surface areas of those surface patches and add them up. Uh, gamma sub mn throughout the talk is going to represent the interface between the mth and the nth region. Um, and we'll be looking at the dynamics, uh, gradient descent dynamics associated with such energies uh, with respect to the L2 inner product. Uh, and this will uh, give rise to a motion of these interfaces by uh, motion by mean curvature. Uh, so, and uh, uh, away from these special places where the curves or the interfaces intersect, such places are known as triple junctions. And at those triple junctions, there will be some uh, natural boundary conditions. Uh, uh, on the angles that form on those at those junctions that need to be satisfied. Uh, so the location of the, these triple junctions uh, are unknown, part of the unknown. They're not pre prescribed. Uh, the fact that we need to satisfy these angle conditions at them, along with the requirement that uh, motion by mean curvature should take place away from them, uh, uniquely determines the flow, uh, at least until there are topological changes. Okay, so let's review very quickly how uh, curvature motion arises as gradient descent for uh, such functionals. The simplest case we can look at is, let's say in the plane, we take a two-phase situation where there is a single set sigma and its complement sig sigma complement. Uh, then we can parameterize the boundary of the set uh, by a curve, gamma. Then we consider perturbing the curve in the normal direction by a vector field. So nu is going to represent the unit outward normal vector field throughout the talk, multiplied by a scalar phi of s. Then we look at the uh, uh, directional derivative of the length functional in the direction of this perturbation. 
And after a very short calculation, you find out that it's given by the inner product between the curvature of the curve and the perturbing function phi. So from here, this calculation, we learn that the uh, gradient of the, um, uh, this length functional is given by the curvature of the curve. Uh, so if you want to do gradient descent, uh, we move every point on the boundary of the set in the opposite direction uh, with, uh, with speed given by curvature. And the sign works out so that convex parts of the curve push in and concave parts push out. OK, and one can uh, repeat the same calculation uh, in higher dimensions. Uh, then one gets that the uh, mean curvature shows up in place of the curvature of the curve here. OK, and you, if you've never seen it, this is what it looks like in the plane. So uh, convex parts push in, concave parts push out. The curve tries to minimize its length as fast as possible, and that leads to this dynamics. Um, OK. So uh, we will also look at the anisotropic version of such motions. So uh, in the two-phase case, again, uh, let's consider now a penalty on, on the boundary of the set, which is not just one integrate along the boundary, but a function phi of the normal. Uh, phi is going to be, for example, in R3, phi is going to be defined on unit vector fields, so it's a function on the unit sphere. Uh, for uh, well-posedness of such a model, we need to uh, uh, require that phi extends in a convex way to one homogeneous, as a one homogeneous function to, uh, to all R3. So we should just think of, uh, I'm sorry, we should just think of sigma, uh, sigma as, um, uh, as, as a norm on R3. It should extend as a norm to all R3. And I will also only consider a smooth and uh, uh, smooth uh, uh, anisotropy sigma, which, which have strongly convex uh, uh, unit balls, in fact. So we stay away from crystalline cases for now. Um, then uh, an important notion is the wolf shape associated with the anisotropy that is simply the unit ball of the dual norm. So if sigma is, for example, the uh, one norm, then the unit ball is the diamond, and uh, the dual norm is the infinity norm, the maximum norm, whose unit ball is, is the square. That's known as the wolf shape associated with that anisotropy. Then um, when one goes through the same kind of calculation, uh, one gets uh, that the, uh, when one does gradient descent on this energy, it leads to an evolution law as given here for uh, surfaces in R3. So it's a little bit more complicated than just mean curvature. You have this additional uh, factors multiplying the two principal curvatures, kappa 1 and kappa, kappa 2. Uh, and uh, these, for example, so sigma shows up, but also the derivative of sigma in the direction of the principal curvatures shows up. So it's a little bit more complicated. In addition, in the application we'll be looking at uh, in material science, uh, we will want the freedom to be able to sneak into here a mobility factor, which is also going to be, in general, an anisotropic function. So it's a function defined on uh, you know, unit vectors. We will, again, just restrict attention to uh, anisotropy functions mu that are given by norms. So they should extend as a norm to all vectors in R3. Um, now, an important property of these flows, all of these flows, including the anisotropic case in the two-phase setting, is a comparison principle. If we have a bunch of curves that are in, uh, ordered by inclusion at initial time, under these flows, all of these flows, they remain ordered. Uh, and it's of interest to understand whether we can design numerical methods that preserve this monotonous, this comparison principle. Such numerical schemes will are uh, referred to as monotone numerical schemes. OK, now going to the uh, multi-phase model, which we are really interested in. Uh, so uh, the ultimate model we'd like to look at has this form. So we have a partition into a capital N number of phases. And uh, for each possible interface, uh, there is, uh, we can choose a different anisotropy function sigma. Uh, so this, is the, uh, this kind of model arises in uh, description of microstructure evolution in polycrystalline materials due to Mullins in 1956. The anisotropy functions depend on the orientation of the crystals on either side. So such materials are composed of lots of uh, single crystal pieces stuck together. And uh, the uh, interfaces in between are, are uh, some places where perhaps the atoms are not completely happy to be. So there's some um, excess internal energy associated with the system. And that has to do with how misoriented to, to the two crystals are on either side. Uh, so this, miso this uh, function sigma depends on, of course, the uh, type of crystal you have and also the misorientation between them and the, and the normal. Uh, we will assume that uh, once we fix the orientations for these uh, 
regions uh, for these crystals, we choose them randomly, for example, then we'll assume that our material scientist uh, colleagues can tell us what those sigmas are. Uh, and then uh, we'd like to do gradient descent for, for this energy with respect to L2 in a product once again. There are some necessary conditions on these sigmas. We need to make sure that they extend as norms to all of R3, and also they need to satisfy um, uh, triangle inequality along every direction. Okay, and at the triple junctions, uh, now uh, some angle condition has to happen and uh, take place. And uh, in the isotropic case, where the sigmas are constants, uh, this is uh, known as the herring angle condition, and it says that basically the forces uh, acting on the triple junction need to vanish. So if I take the tangent, tangential directions to the three curves meeting at one of these triple junctions and uh, multiply by them by the corresponding surface tensions, which are constants now, they should add up to zero. This uh, relation can be rearranged to give an expression for the angles that form at the triple junction in terms of the surface tensions of the uh, interfaces meeting there. For example, if all the sigmas happen to be equal to each other, one gets that all these triple junctions have to be 120 degrees symmetric. And uh, in general, there may be stable multiple junctions, uh, even in this case, if the sigmas are uh, different from one another. Uh, the, all this is to say is that uh, numerical methods for these, uh, this kind of evolution have to, of course, impose these conditions correctly at these free boundaries, and they can get quite, quite complicated. In fact, if we now go to, okay, so let me just show a simulation for the kind of uh, uh, simulations I would like to be able to do here is a simulation with many regions, um, and uh, all these curves are evolving by curvature motion, and at the triple junctions, they try to to satisfy the 120 degree uh, uh, angle condition. Lots of uh, topological changes happen in, the, in between, and of course we're interested in numerical methods that can handle these topological changes in a reasonably simple way. Okay, now if you go to the anisotropic case, then uh, where the sigmas are now functions of the normal, the, uh, the uh, condition that needs to hold at the triple junctions uh, becomes even more complicated. So uh, let's see, the top row is what we had before, but now we also get some additional torque terms that try to twist this configuration in uh, the small energy uh, direction somehow for the given anisotropies. And once again, there may be stable uh, uh, higher degree junctions present. Okay, one more uh, notion we have to review before we move on is that of minimizing movements. Uh, so. Uh, this is a very simple uh, and general idea uh, which, which can be used to generate a time discrete approximation for a gradient flow. So let's imagine that we have an energy E defined on some inner product space, and then the gradient descent is described by some abstract ODE. Then uh, we can always try to uh, generate a time discrete approximation to the gradient flow by solving a sequence of uh, variational problems at every time step. So to go from time step k, the configuration at time step k is, let's say, u, uk, to go to uk plus 1, we minimize these, some of these two terms. The first term is, of course, the original energy we're trying to minimize, but we need an additional term that makes sure that we don't move too far in a single time step. Uh, so we can take the uh, inner product and uh, put down the corresponding norm squared on the, uh, on this, on the perturbation. So this term, of course, tries to prevent motion from happening. It's happiest when V is equal to UK. So we'll refer to it as, as the movement limiter. And uh, in fact, if we um, uh, include it as, like this, uh, as this, uh, in this form, uh, then uh, in, in a very general setting, you can generate an approximation to the gradient flow. So this is a useful uh, uh, procedure because, first of all, uh, you can look at situations where you're not really in the very classical sense of uh, situation of uh, gradient descent, where you have an inner product. You can put a, any kind of norm squared here or even a, some sort of metric uh, squared. Um, and also from a numerical perspective, it allows you to uh, use, let's say, if you have a very good numerical method for the stationary problem, uh, you can, an optimization algorithm basically, you can use it to generate uh, approximations for the dynamic problem as well. Um, so, as an example, if we take as our energy the Dirichlet energy, and uh, of course we know that the L2 gradient descent for that leads to the heat equation, uh, then this procedure applied to that would give us this variation problem to solve at every time step, uh, which, if you just work out the or Lagrange equation, tells you that uh, you evolve by the backward uh, order scheme. Moreover, you get automatically natural Neumann boundary conditions if you carry out this minimization over all, all functions V without putting any restrictions on them. 
So this is a nice way to also get uh, boundary conditions uh, automatically. Uh, so we are going to reinterpret an existing numerical method from this point of view. And of course, uh, I should say, this was considered in the, uh, in the context of uh, geometric flows by the Georgi, Algen, Taylor, Wang, Lukas, and Storz, and Hecker uh, uh, a long time ago. Okay, now let me tell you about uh, the numerical methods we'll be dealing with. They're called threshold dynamics, and they're particularly simple, especially given how complicated the dynamics we're trying to uh, approximate is. Uh, it was uh, proposed originally by Merriman, Benson, and Osher in 89, and I will start with the simplest setting of two-phase isotropic uh, curvature flow. Um, so it generates a time discrete uh, approximation to the flow. Suppose that you want uh, to evolve the boundary of a set sigma in any dimension uh, by motion by mean curvature. So you first fix yourself a time step size delta t and then uh, uh, generate the time discrete uh, uh, approximation sigma k at time step k as follows. So suppose you already have sigma k, how do you go to sigma k plus 1? So you take the characteristic function of the set at the k time step convolved with the Gaussian, uh, so the uh, fundamental solution of the heat equation, and you run it for a very short time, time delta t. So it becomes, of course, a blurred uh, characteristic function. Do it also for the, uh, the complement of the set. So blur both of those characteristic functions. Now, at the next time step, you have to decide which point uh, in your domain belongs to the interior of the set and which belongs to the complement. That is decided by a competition. Whoever has the largest convolution value at that point claims the point for himself. Now, of course, phi1 and phi2 in this setting has to have to add up to 1 at every point, so you can even simplify it further, eliminate phi2. This expression is equivalent to saying that uh, after convolving the interior, the characteristic function of the interior of the set with, one, uh, with the Gaussian, you blur it, so then you chop it at the middle, at 1 over 2. And whatever is above 1 over 2 ends up uh, in the interior. So perhaps we should take a look at what it looks like and then come back to the benefits. Okay, uh, hopefully the movie runs. Yes, uh, so it alternates these diffusion and uh, sharpening steps, and in the process, the boundary uh, automatically moves by motion by mean curvature. Now, if I can go back, uh, sorry, trying to go back. Yeah, now uh, some benefits, I'm sorry, some benefits of, of this method are, first of all, it's uh, uh, preserves this monotonicity principle, for example, because convolution with a Gaussian, of course, preserves this uh, uh, ordering between any two sets, and this thresholding step is also completely pointwise and very simple to see. That also preserves the monotonicity comparison principle, so it's unconditionally monotone, regardless of how large a time step you choose, and that can give you unconditional stability. Uh, now, the consistency of the scheme can be checked very easily by a Taylor expansion on some smooth interface. So it moves the interface by the correct velocity uh, in a very simple calculation. Now, when you combine those two ingredients, there's a very well-known um, framework of Bowles and Suganides that says once you have those two ingredients, essentially you can prove convergence to the viscosity solution of motion by mean curvature. And that was carried out by a number of authors, including Evans, Bowles and George Land, Bowles and Suganides. Uh, and, of course, uh, you can also try to extend this. For instance, you can say, why use a Gaussian, use something that's not radially symmetric, then perhaps we can generate an isotropic motions, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, now, in the same paper, Merman, Benson, Osher, back in 89, also gave an extension of their algorithm to the multiphase setting. So now, suppose you have n capital N phases again. So what you do is, at, at every time step, uh, uh, you take the characteristic function of each one of those phases, blur them out with the Gaussian, store them in these blurred functions phi sub n. At the next time step, you again have to decide which phase claims which point for himself. That is again done by a very simple competition. Whoever has the largest convolution value, so in other words, whoever has, uh, in some sense, uh, highest density, defined in terms of this uh, uh, Gaussian around the point, claims the point for himself. Uh, amazingly, these ver two very simple steps, which can be programmed in MATLAB, for example, in uh, literally five lines, uh, captures uh, everything that we want to uh, simulate in the case where all these sigmas, the, uh, the uh, surface tensions are, and the mobilities are equal to one. So all angles are 120 degrees. 
So away from any triple junction, one can immediately see that this reduces to the two-phase setting of the algorithm and generates motion by mean curvature. Uh, and more interestingly, perhaps, uh, around triple junctions, it imposes the correct angle condition 120 degrees automatically. And all this happens without ever having to worry about whether x, for example, a point x is in the interior of a, gra of a grain or a region, or whether it's at the boundary, or whether it's a triple junction. Just everything happens automatically. So our interest is to ask whether something as simple as this can really be extended to the much more complicated setting where, first of all, you have uh, unequal surface tensions in the isotropic case, but also uh, even going to the anisotropic setting. Okay. Um, OK, I will skip the simulation, because in the interest of time, um, and uh, uh, tell you about now uh, the uh, new results. Uh, so. Let's su summarize the challenges in threshold dynamics is as follows. Can we extend these very simple type of algorithms to the setting of, first of all, isotropic, multiple phase, but unequal surface tensions? So, so sigmas are now uh, constants. They don't depend on the normal. But already this was not known. And people have tried. Uh, and uh, they tried to uh, use the original way that the algorithm was uh, discovered, which does not generalize very well, unfortunately. So what we will really do is we will uh, discover, we'll um, reverse engineer the algorithm and find a different way of deriving it that does generalize to these cases. Okay. Uh, then I will go to the anisotropic setting and look at, uh, first of all, the two-phase setting and ask, well, if you want me to generate this evolution for a given anisotropic surface tension and mobility, can I find a kernel, construct a kernel, that if I use in place of the Gaussian in this very simple algorithm that I just showed, would generate exactly this uh, dynamics. That was also uh, unknown. The next question to ask is, while doing that, may, can I make sure that uh, I preserve the monotonicity of the evolution? And finally, uh, the ultimate model that I like to look at is, somebody gives you n choose two uh, anisotropic surface tensions and n choose two mobilities, and your job is now to simulate the very complicated dynamics associated with, uh, with that situation. Okay, now our starting point is again, uh, as I said, will be a, a way to reverse engineer the whole thing. And I'll start with the two phase uh, situation, isotropic situation, and rederive Merriman Benson Osher scheme in a completely different way than the original way that it was discovered. So, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, and uh, it, uh, it's our starting point is a Lyapunov functional for, uh, for the scheme. So uh, suppose that we want to measure the perimeter of a set like this one. Uh, here is a, a non-local approximation to perimeter that can be described in a very nice and intuitive way. To measure the, approximate the length of the boundary of the set, take an initial temperature distribution of one inside the set and zero outside. Then, sorry, then, um, diffuse it with the heat equation, okay? So some of the heat, of course, escapes to the uh, uh, exterior, then measure how much heat escaped to the exterior of the, of the domain. So take uh, the Gaussian convo with the characteristic function, that's the new temperature distribution at time t, integrated over the complement of the set, sigma, uh, sigma complement. Now, if this set had a very oscillatory boundary, it would be a very good radiator, and you would imagine that a lot of heat would escape to the exterior. So in some very intuitive sense, uh, this should measure something related to the perimeter of the set. Okay? And in fact, um, the, this energy, if you uh, normalize it uh, uh, appropriately, um, in, a, in an obvious way, actually, uh, is known to converge to the perimeter of sets in a very precise sense, in the sense of gamma convergence. Um, it was, the energy itself is not new. It was actually studied by Alberti and Belletti in 98, and there are other authors as well, and uh, they established this gamma convergence. What is new is its connection with threshold dynamics, this algorithm that Merriman Benson Osher uh, came up with. Okay. okay, so let me tell you what the connection is. Um, uh, so, I'd like to show you that, in fact, threshold dynamics dissipates this energy at every time step. To see this, uh, let's do the following. It's hard to work with sets because, of course, that's not, not a uh, convex uh, 
uh, collection uh, 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 of things to work with. So let's replace them sets by functions. So let u1 stand in for the characteristic function of the set sigma, and u2 stand in for the characteristic function of sigma complement. Now, of course, uh, if they were literally equal, they would have to be binary functions, and we would have to have a binary partition uh, of the set. We're going to relax that constraint and insist just that u1 and u2 sum up to 1 at every point, and they are positive functions. So this is a box constraint. It's a relaxation of the binary uh, partitioning constraint. Then, in terms of u1 and u2, I can rewrite my energy very simply as follows. So gt convolution u1, that's the integrand here. I'm integrating over sigma complement, so I just multiply by u2 and integrate over the entire space. OK. Now, uh, this is a very simple quadratic integrand. There is a convolution in it. So obviously, we should use the Fourier transform to re-express it. Uh, so this is what I've just done. Eliminate the u2 variable using the second constraint. So it becomes 1 minus u1 take the Fourier transform, then the energy can be written this way. The first term is linear, so let's ignore that for a second. The second term is quadratic, and I see that it has a minus sign in front, and it's being multiplied by a Fourier transform of the Gaussian, which is, of course, another Gaussian, and therefore positive. So from here, I immediately see that this energy is concave. Now, I'm minimizing a concave energy over a convex constraint set. So of course, the minimizer is going to be at the extreme points. The extreme points of the box constraint are binary partitions. So this is the exact relaxation, and we have lost nothing at all. So it's equivalent to the original problem. However, now we're in the realm of uh, continuous optimization. So it's a little bit easier to do. Now, positivity of the Gaussian is essential, uh, of, the, of the free transform of the Gaussian is essential for uh, what I'm going to do to talk about next, that it is intimately related to the, the uh, dissipation property. Okay. okay, now here is a very simple optimization uh, strategy applied to this uh, uh, very simple quadratic energy. Suppose you want to minimize this energy, here is one thing you can do. You can uh, suppose you're at the current configuration is u1k, u2k at the k time step. To minimize the energy, linearize it at this current configuration. And here I wrote down the linearization of the energy, and I threw away the constant terms. They are not relevant. Minimize it over the entire constraint set. Okay? Then, well, what do you have to do? Uh, I have a total mass of 1 to allocate between u1 and u2 at every grid point, but all grid points are decoupled, so it's a very easy minimization to solve. So what should I do? Whoever has the smallest uh, coefficient in front should take all the mass, and the other guy should uh, be starved. If you think about it for a second, that turns precisely into the thresholding step in the merriman benson osher scheme. So what we have uh, managed to do is we have uh, re-engineered, reverse-engineered threshold dynamics as a op very simple optimization uh, procedure applied to this non-local approximation for perimeter. Okay. And this will be the key to the generalization because this is a very simple idea. You take a non-local approximation to perimeter, you linearize and then minimize linearization over the entire constraint set. This gives you a systematic way of deriving threshold dynamics type schemes. Okay. And now, you, what we should ask, yes, but uh, why should I expect linearization to minimize the original energy itself? Well, as we saw, the original energy is concave. So if I decrease the linearization at every time step, of course, the graph of the uh, functional lies under the uh, linearization. Therefore, it has to go down as well at every time step. And that is uh, giving you this uh, unconditional stability. And once again, the concavity of the energy was intimately connected with the positivity of the Fourier transform you're using. Uh, uh, sorry, positivity of the Fourier transform of the kernel that you're using. Uh, whereas the two-phase comparison principle has to do with positivity of the kernel in the physical space. So. Uh, uh, these are two different important properties of the kernel, important for two different tools for analyzing these kinds of motions. One of them is for maximum principle type things, and the other one is for these more energetic type uh, uh, tools. Okay. okay, one more important uh, point to make is um, uh, now that linearization can be written in a slightly different way. In fact, the linearization of the energy uh, can be written as the sum of two terms again. One of them is the original uh, energy that we start, quadratic energy, that non-local approximation to perimeter, the Lyapunov function that we started with. Uh, if I subtract from that this original same energy applied to the perturbation, then I get precise linearization. So what we're doing, in fact, is minimizing the linearization at uh, this sum of these two terms at every every time step, uh, which means. Uh, uh, I can look at this second term as a movement limiter. 
Right? Uh, in fact, if I do a very simple back of the envelope calculation, I take, let's say, a smooth set sigma and uh, start to move it in the normal direction by a vector field phi times nu, and look at how this movement limiter behaves, I discover that it looks exactly like the L2 norm squared of the perturbing vector field. So, not only is uh, threshold dynamics trying to uh, dissipate this uh, Lyapunov functional, the connection between them is actually much more intimate. It is, in fact, trying very hard to generate uh, uh, gradient descent for this Lyapunov functional with respect to the correct metric. So another way of saying that, the upshot is threshold dynamics generates gradient descent for approximately the right energy with respect to approximately the right metric. So, of course, this is a very informal way of talking about things, but uh, this point of view can be used, and in fact has been used by Lux and Otto in uh, subsequent work, to prove uh, conditional convergence of the algorithm to the correct dynamics, uh, to a weak formulation of this uh, very complicated multiphase evolution, including in the, in the multiphase uh, uh, setting. Okay, so our strategy for extending threshold dynamics to more interesting uh, models is going to be to avoid uh, uh, get, trying to guess the extension. People have done that and they've guessed wrong. Uh, instead, what we do is extend the variation formulation first, then we turn the crank, apply the optimization procedure that I just discussed, uh, relax, linearize, minimize over the constraint set, and this gives you a systematic way to derive such algorithms. And we will look at the isotropic multiphase case uh, with entries to distinct uh, surface tensions first, then we'll go on to the anisotropic setting. Okay, so how can we extend this idea to uh, isotropic but unequal surface tension setting? So suppose somebody gives us entries to surface tensions, constants associated with uh, each possible interface in a setting with n phases. So to be able to do this, I need to approximate these uh, uh, not the entire perimeter of the set, but pieces of the perimeter that lie between the i and the j phase. So, uh, in the spirit of the Lyapunov functional that we just discussed, I can take an initial temperature distribution of one inside the i set. Then, then uh, diffuse it out by the heat equation. So that's given by the integrand here, and measure how much heat escapes into the jth region. So not to the entire uh, complement, but just into the jth region. That should give me a pretty good approximation to the size of the interface between the two, two regions. Okay. okay, but then uh, now that I know um, how to approximate the area the sur of the surface patch between the nth and the nth region, uh, recall that the isotropic energy that we're trying to approximate with unequal surface tension is like this. So I have a way to approximate this piece that's given here, multiplied by the corresponding surface tensions and sum them up. Okay, the first result we can show is that, in fact, as uh, the width of the kernel goes to zero, the, these non-local approximations to multiphase perimeter once again gamma converge to the, um, uh, to the sharp interface model given here. And, uh, of course, you need uh, the surface tension to satisfy this triangle inequality for this to take place. Um, all right. And, and now you play the same game. So you take that non-local energy, which is nice and quadratic. You uh, linearize it at the current configuration, minimize the relax, uh, minimize the given con uh, configuration, uh, linearization uh, 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 over the entire constraint set, and you end up with the first new algorithm now, um, which is the extension of uh, merriman benson osher to the unequal surface tension setting. So what you're doing, it's, it's almost exactly the same algorithm. Uh, yeah, so it's as simple as the original algorithm, uh, and it reduces to the uh, original multiphase merriman benson osher if all the surface tension sigma are equal to each other. So all you have to do is uh, you take a certain combination of the characteristic functions, convolve them with, to, with Gaussians, store them in these smoothed out uh, variables, and then do some sort of a very simple pointwise comparison, and that's it. So very simple modification. However, uh, without going through this systematic procedure, it was not possible for people to, to guess this, and we had to go through this uh, uh, roundabout way of uh, arriving at it. Uh, the remarkable thing is that it imposes all the correct angle conditions at all the triple junctions and so on. Okay. Now, whereas there is one caveat. The mobilities turn out to be very special. They are related to the surface tensions by this very funny relation. Uh, but I'll address that later on. Okay. So uh, that's not hard to fix. Okay. Um, now, moving on to the multi... Uh, uh, to the... Um, Okay, before we move on, 
I, I uh, swept under the rug a few details. One of these details is, um, is um, remember for to see that the, uh, such a simple algorithm dissipates the energy at every time step, it is essential to check that this non-local energy is concave. Right? Now, uh, if I can manage to go back for uh, a few slides. Um, okay, this one. Yeah. Um, if you look here, uh, these terms, unlike in the two-phase case, I can't guarantee that these are concave anymore. In fact, they're not. Uh, because um, uh, this is not measuring the approximating the perimeter of a, of, a, of a region. It's not a, the length of a boundary of a region, right? It's an open surface patch. And those are not guaranteed to be concave individually. But perhaps if you sum them up with a certain surface tensions, maybe they add up to a concave function. And that needs to be checked. And that actually requires something from these surface tensions. Okay. okay. Now, uh, it turns out that the concavity of the energy you end up with depends on the surface tensions. Uh, and if I think about the surface tensions as a matrix, so it has, of course, positive entries. It's zero along the diagonal. It's symmetric. Um, and, um, and, uh, and it also satisfies a triangle inequality, in fact, as we discussed. Then uh, uh, it turns out that in order for our energy to be concave, the surface tension matrix then has to be conditionally negative definite. So it should be a negative definite quadratic form when restricted to vectors psi, which are in the perpendicular component of the vector of all ones. Uh, so it, vectors uh, whose components sum up to zero. It should be a, a, a negative definite, uh, 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 sorry, negative semi-definite uh, quadratic form on that. Um, and uh, it was understood already back in 1930s by Schoenberg that such matrices, these uh, conditional negative definite uh, matrices, are intimately connected with questions of embeddability of uh, finite matrix spaces in Euclidean spaces. So his theorem, for example, says that uh, if the entries of your matrix can be realized as squared distances between a bunch of points coming from some Euclidean space, then uh, it is going to be conditionally negative definite and vice versa. Okay. Now, the surface tensions in many uh, simulations that material scientists are interested in, uh, they come from uh, certain models of how surface tensions arise. One of those is due to Reed and Shockley going back to the 1950s. So if you tell, uh, if you fix your orientations for your uh, uh, crystal pieces, um, which are going to be basically rotation matrices, described by rotation matrices, uh, the uh, material scientists calculate the corresponding surface tension between any two grains as some sort of a distance defined on elements on SO3. So, um, well, it's not Euclidean space, but it's not something too bizarre either. So the surface tensions that material scientists are interested in are in some sense already embedded in something that's not too bizarre. And that gives us hope. That, and in fact, we can show uh, in one of the highlights of our uh, results uh, that uh, if you calculate your surface tensions as uh, according to reed Shockley model, for instance, then the energy will in fact turn out to be concave and therefore the algorithm will in fact be unconditionally stable. Thank you. OK, now uh, let's move on to the uh, anisotropy uh, question. Um, so uh, already in the two-phase setting, there has been uh, a lot of work devoted to extending the merriman vance osher scheme to anisotropic curvature flows. Uh, already the original paper um, uh, is, uh, mentions that if you choose your convolution kernel to be something more general, let's say not radial symmetric, you might be able to generate uh, these anisotropic flows. Then uh, one of the first uh, uh, contributions is due to Ishii, Pires, and Suganides. What they do is that they say, well, give me a positive kernel K, then they can calculate the normal velocity associated with uh, uh, that, that the algorithm generates if you use that K um, in, in the convolution step of the algorithm. But uh, that doesn't answer the question, the uh, inverse question, for that uh, as a numerical analyst we might be interested in, which says that uh, if you give me the sigma, the surface tension, and the mobility functions, can I construct a kernel K that will generate the normal velocity that you want? Uh, the first contribution in that uh, direction is due to Ruth and Merriman. They have a construct construction in two dimensions. Uh, it doesn't generalize to 3D. Uh, and there is something special about in 2D, uh, you cannot distinguish between the surface tension and mobility just by looking at uh, two-dimensional flows. 
So that's a little bit of a degenerate situation, and uh, for that reason also doesn't generalize to 3D. Uh, more recently, Bonnetier, Bhutan, and Chambol uh, have a construction, but uh, their kernels uh, are singular in the Fourier domain. They therefore have very slow decay in the um, physical domain. Uh, uh, the mobility is very special. It's an important class of mobility, but uh, it's a very special type of mobility. It has to be equal to the surface tension. Uh, and their kernels can change sign uh, even for very simple anisotropies, even in two dimensions. So some questions we can try to answer using this variational framework that I just uh, discussed is, uh, given sigma and mu, can I find a kernel that, uh, M, uh, that will generate the corresponding evolution for that sigma and mu? So can I bake in the surface tension and mobility that, let's say, colleagues and uh, material scientists give me into my convolution kernel K? Can I make sure that the K is positive in physical space so that I preserve monotonicity of the algorithm in two-phase setting? And can I make sure that its Fourier transform is perhaps positive so that many of the discussions, variational discussions that I uh, went over uh, are also preserved? Okay. How about can I make K smooth with rapid decay? Okay. So all of these questions we will be able to answer. Okay, now uh, our starting point again is uh, this variational formulation. Uh, if I do a very simple back-of-the-envelope calculation uh, by taking a smooth set and uh, evaluating my, this non-local energy uh, with a convolution kernel K uh, on that set, I find out that uh, as the time step size goes to zero, uh, that energy turns into this uh, integral over the boundary of the set, okay? with an integrand that depends on the normal. The integrand, the sigma sub K, has this very simple relation uh, in terms of the convolution kernel K. Okay? So we obtain a very simple formula that tells me what the corresponding surface tension is for a given convolution kernel K that you would use in the Merman band social scheme. Okay? If I do another very simple back of the envelope calculation, which is to take a smooth, uh, cur a smooth uh, set again and start moving it in the normal direction by this vector field, phi times nu, and look at how the movement limiter term uh, behaves, um, uh, then, in fact, um, um, I find out that uh, it has this expression again in terms of the, uh, uh, of the convolution kernel. So it's precisely like the uh, two norm squared of the vector field multiplied by a factor here. But this is precisely where the uh, mobility function comes from. Okay? And uh, that gives me a very simple formula for uh, the mobility of the uh, uh, associated with a given kernel K. So upshot is each kernel comes with a surface tension, preferred surface tension, and mobility. Okay, they can also be exp expressed very simply. These formulas can be expressed very simply in terms of the Fourier transform of the kernel as well. So I have to uh, uh, hurry and summarize. Um, so now, if you want to uh, if somebody gives you a desired surface tension and mobility and you want to find a kernel K that corresponds to that surface tension and mobility, you have to solve a couple system of integral equations okay, given here. If you put these in polar coordinates, it turns out that the integral equations are related to two very well-known transforms. One of them is known as the cosine transform. It's a transform on even functions on the sphere. And the other one is even better known. It's the uh, Radio, it's the um, uh, spherical Radon transform. So one of them is an integral over the entire sphere, the other one is integration along uh, great circles. But uh, when you do that, um, then your integral equations get decoupled in radial directions uh, so they are much easier to solve. So if you can somehow manage to take the inverse cosine transform, inverse, inverse spherical Radon transform uh, of your anisotropy function sigma and your mobility, then you have a much easier system to solve. And uh, these being very well studied transforms, there exist very classical inversion formulas for them. Okay. okay. Uh, now, an immediate observation uh, by the way, from these equations is that if your kernel K is positive, then the right-hand sides better be positive as well. Okay? And the positivity of the kernel K in physical domain has to do with monotonicity of the scheme if, in the two-phase setting, if you remember. Okay? So now you can ask, well, for what kind of anisotropies do we have the, the uh, um, inverse cosine transform positive and inverse spherical radon transform uh, uh, positive? Okay? Those questions, it turns out, have been very well studied. Uh, 
Here are some facts, and I'm quoting from a well-known paper in the convex geometry literature. It turns out in two dimensions, all anisotropies have uh, positive inverse cosine transforms, but in 3D, that's no longer the case. Uh, the inverse cosine uh, transform of an anisotropy is positive if and only if the corresponding wolf shape happens to be what's known as a zonoid. So zonoids are defined in terms of limits of zonotopes. Uh, so let me first define what zonotopes are. They are these uh, polytopes, each face of which is a centrally symmetric polygon. Okay. Here they are. Now, zonoids are everything you can approximate with such polytopes in the Hausdorff distance, and you can approximate a lot with them. So certainly these smoothed out versions of them, but also uh, spheres, ellipses, and so on. So you can do a lot, but the point is that you can't do everything. Okay? And one thing you cannot approximate is, in fact, uh, an octahedron whose uh, faces are uh, uh, triangles. So in fact, there is an entire neighborhood in the Hausdorff distance of the octahedron, which you cannot approximate by uh, zonoids. And for that reason, for such, if somebody gives you an anisotropy that is a small enough neighborhood of the octahedron, no matter how convex, strictly convex and smooth it is, you cannot approximate it by threshold dynamics type schemes that preserve the monotonous principle. Okay. okay. Uh, I have very few seconds left, so I have to summarize. Uh, how about, uh, it turns out that there are also restrictions on the kind of mobilities you can have so that the um, um, inverse uh, uh, spherical radon transform turns out to be positive. That has also been studied very well in the convex geometry literature. It is related to a problem known as the boozman petty problem. Uh, I don't have time to describe. Uh, but uh, we need to use the, uh, the uh, solution of this problem in dimension three from this paper. And with small modifications of all these results, if you put them together, uh, this is what you end up with, a barrier theorem, which says a threshold dynamic scheme that is consistent with an anisotropic surface tension sigma and mobility mu given by a norm cannot possibly be monotone unless the, the uh, roof shape of the anisotropy is the Minkowski sum of a zonoid and a sphere. So a complete pictorial characterization of when you can expect such schemes to preserve the monotonicity principle. The converse, by the way, is also essentially true, and it's nice and very simple construction, because remember that once you've taken the inverse transforms of these uh, anisotropy functions, you get a very simple uh, uh, integral equations that are now decoupled in radial directions to solve for the convolution kernel, so you can propose an ansatz and then solve for your convolution kernel very simply. Uh, okay, and let me maybe jump to the uh, conclusion. Uh, you can do a construction in the Fourier domain as well. Okay. Um, if you want the, your kernels to have, for example, positive Fourier transform, there's another construction for that. And there are no restrictions in that case on the anisotropies. Uh, but ultimately, here's the situation we arrive in. Suppose you give me pairs of anisotropic surface tensions and mobilities. I am now in a position to bake those into convolution kernels, which don't look very uh, um, natural things at all. They are not easy to guess. But you go through this procedure, take those inverse transforms of these classical uh, integral transforms, and then uh, uh, and put them into these uh, um, ansatz and then solve for your convolution kernel. You get some convolution kernel that bakes in all these anisotropies into them. And now you can go ahead and do the uh, uh, analog. I'm sorry, uh, you can just uh, put them into your uh, non-local energy with those convolution kernels, go through the same procedure, turn the crank, and drive the corresponding threshold dynamic scheme, which uh, uh, appears to do the right thing. Uh, but in this setting, we don't know if, um, uh, if the energy uh, is, uh, you end up with is concave, uh, or whether it's gamma convergence to the correct thing. So our understanding is uh, very incomplete. But uh, numerically, if you look at some uh, numerical examples, it seems to be doing the right thing. So this is a comparison with uh, uh, just a uh, very simple method using uh, parameterized curves. And uh, uh, it numerically seems to converge to the correct uh, evolution. OK, I'll have to conclude there. Uh, and here are my conclusions. Thank you so much. So, any question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so in the uh, optimization uh, part. So, why 
is it necessary to linearize? Could you, could you? Yeah, so that's not a choice we made. Uh, in some sense, um, uh, uh, that's uh, just the reverse engineering of the algorithm. It turns out that's what the original merriman benz osher algorithm is doing. So uh, it, uh, it wasn't our choice. Of course, merriman benz osher didn't know this either because that's not how they obtained their algorithm. But this is one way of explaining what the algorithm is doing that generalizes to the uh, more complicated models. So uh, it, it really wasn't uh, a choice that we made. Or if you do not linearize, uh, would, it, would it do the right thing if you didn't linearize? Um, it's concave. So if you have some way of finding the minimum of that, uh, sorry, quadratic energy, it's a concave quadratic energy, so the minimizer would still be a, a like a partition, it will still decrease the energy. So it would do it, but then uh, that, that's an optimization problem that's not non that is not trivial that you need to solve, uh, whereas the linearization is trivial to do because it gives you this very simple thresholding uh, step. So it wouldn't be a simple thresholding type of algorithm anymore. Okay. Another question? Just, just, just one simple question. You talk about monotone uh, numerical schemes. Yes. What is the, mono, the monotonicity you are taking there? Yeah, so uh, if the evolution in the two-phase situation preserves ordering of solutions. So if you start with two curves, let's say, in the plane, one including the other, uh, okay. then that ordering should be preserved. That's the maximum principle for this, uh, these types of evolutions. It's a fundamental property of the underlying PD. And uh, of course, we're interested in numerical schemes that would uh, preserve that. Uh, so when I say it's monotone, that means it preserves this property. And the benefit there is if you can preserve the monotonicity, then this uh, 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 Barles and Suganidis uh, procedure kicks in, and you get uh, convergence proof uh, almost immediately to the viscosity solution. Right. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. I think that's it. So thank, we thank again the speaker. Thank you.